However, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you today Dr. Alison Thornburn. Uh, she did her PhD studies um, with Phil Hansborough up in Newcastle, working on uh, asthma and uh, other lung and inflammatory and infectious diseases, uh, and is now a postdoctoral researcher in the Mackay Laboratory at Monash University. I'm actually really lucky I've, I've seen a version of this talk, or I, I saw some of the data that Alison presented in, in our divisional uh, meeting a couple of weeks ago. And her, her data is stunning, phenomenal, and really, really interesting and exciting, very topical. Uh, it's, you know, goes the whole gamut through from um, fundamental, interesting, basic science discoveries uh, through to things that are applicable to all of us in our, our daily lives in terms of diet and um, uh, metabolism and all these things. And um, she actually wasn't going to show any of that data today. So I was lucky that I caught her a couple of minutes ago and I said, look, that data is so awesome. You have to give us some of it. And I think she's copied a few slides in for the end of the talk. So um, we'll wait for that with bated breath. And uh, thanks, Alison. <laughs> no worries. Thanks, Seth. <laughs> First of all, thank you for the um, opportunity to um, take this lecture. It's a real honour to, um, to give this lecture. And um, sorry to the microphone guy for breaking, breaking his microphone. <laughs> and um, I hope this is OK. Um, so I wasn't quite sure, as Seth mentioned, um, I spoke um, in the inflammation group just recently about my data. And um, I'd been asked to give this talk as well. And I thought, I thought of them as completely different entities. And it wasn't until um, Seth just said to me then um, to put some of the um, data on the end, I thought, oh, yeah, it's kind of important. <laughs> and um, so hopefully, yeah, I, I haven't sort of uh, factored in how long that will take. And um, we'll see how we go. So someone just put your hand up if, you know, <laughs> I'm going way too long. <laughs> um, so... Um, I just wanted to bring up something that Hippoc Hippocrates once said, which was, many of you probably know this, he said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy th food. Um, I think this is um, something that we're just becoming to realise is very important, that uh, food is actually very important for health and um, we're only just starting to be, uh, become more aware of the depth of what this means. Oops. So today I'm going to, this is a bit of an overview of the talk, um, just go through the change in the incidence of diseases, uh, particularly in the Western world, and uh, particularly uh, why this has occurred and all the theories behind why uh, the incidence of disease and disorders have gone up over time. Uh, then I'll take you into the microbiome and explain where we're at with that. Uh, and this touches then into metabolism, particularly key metabolites and metabolic pathways uh, that uh, are involved uh, and intersect the immune system. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the mechanism and the metabolite sensing receptors underlying these pathways, uh, and then get into microbiota and its use as immunotherapy. And the sixth point that should be on there, I will get into a little bit of my data that's uh, quite new and unpublished. So first of all, I just want to raise, uh, many of you have probably seen this. Uh, I feel like I'm in the wrong position. <laughs> Am I allowed to move? <laughs> it's all right. Um, just want to point out that over, this is from 1950 to 19 uh, to 2000. So the last, um, so a 50 year period where we've had these dramatic decreases in the incidence of infectious disease, such as rheumatic fever, uh, measles, mumps, tuberculosis, and hepatitis A. But paralleling this, we've had this dramatic increase in inflammatory diseases, such as MS, Crohn's disease, asthma, and type 1 diabetes. Now, this uh, parallel of the decrease in incidence of diseases, infectious diseases, and the increase of immune disorders has really led to a number of hypotheses over the years. Many of you would know this one, the hygiene hypothesis. So this was originally formed by, um, uh, back in 1989, and it was based on family size. But then over time, this has been extended to cleanliness and vaccinations and antibiotic use. Um, and this hypothesis really proposes that it's the reduced exposure to infectious agents that's led to this dysregulation of immune response. So such that we have ridiculously 
clean uh, practices in the Western world, and also coupled with increased antibiotic use, this has really led to a state where the immune system is no longer functioning as it used to, and it's no longer educated to function as it used to. So another hypothesis that came up um, was um, by Graham Rock uh, just not so long ago, about 10 years ago, and he proposed the old friends or microbiota hypothesis. Now, this was more based on uh, not infectious exposure, but just uh, more dependent on our natural microbiota. And it was more through uh, this hunter-gatherer kind of uh, hypothesis that we have co-evolved with our microbes and our immune system has co-evolved uh, with these microbes. And we are, as such, very much dependent on these microbes um, for our immune system to develop properly and also to function properly. So that was one of them. I forgot to say that the hygiene hypothesis um, is a little bit flaky, and there's some countries that don't fit the hygiene hypothesis, such as Japan, where it's really clean, but they have quite low incidence of inflammatory diseases. So many people have come up with other hypotheses along the way to try and explain better this association between uh, this increase in uh, inflammatory diseases. So another one that was proposed even more recently was the microbial diversity hypothesis. And this was proposed sort of over a couple of years. And really what this proposed was that the, it was the diversity and the turnover of the bacterial species in the gut uh, that was driving inflammatory diseases in the Western world. So you can see from this graph that the, um, so this on the y-axis, we have the number of uh, species in this particular population, and we have age uh, along the x-axis. And you can see in the US, it's just these blue dots, you have, what is that, around uh, the thousands of uh, species, whereas the uh, American Indians and um, those in Malawi have a much more diverse uh, species throughout their whole life, so from quite young right through to um, quite old. So uh, this, um, this was really key in driving this uh, hypothesis, and um, the, the real basis for this was that uh, it was key, these species are really key for priming and regulating the immune system. But what we also realise <laughs> is there's another hypothesis, so um, we also realize now that the microbiota is very much driven by diet. So there came the diet hypotheses. So this is more based on it's what we eat, that is what's driving the microbiota, that is what um, directs the development and function of the immune system. So that's just a basic picture there. So what we have here is we have the diet, uh, particularly the intake of fiber, um, also leading uh, coming into play here is obesity, that really directly alters the micro, microbial composition. But at the same time, we have a number of other factors that have been uh, considered in the other uh, hypotheses, such as uh, uh, infection or inflammation or hygiene, also stress and age, uh, but also the host genetics and uh, maternal transfer, uh, such as cesarean birth versus natural birth. And ultimately, all these factors are impacting upon the microbial composition and leading either to a symbiotic or dysbiotic uh, microbial population. And in a um, well-maintained symbiosis, we have the production of all these anti-inflammatory molecules that lead to this immune-regulated state or homeostasis. However, if this is not um, maintained and we have a dysbiosis of the microbial population, we, we tend to, um, uh, this leads to the uh, expression of virulence factors which dysregulate the immune system and lead to inflammatory diseases. So uh, it's really the diet that we've um, become to understand is really the basis of all of these hypotheses. And when we look back uh, in time, there's been, um, there's this interpretation that we've gone through a phase of nutritional transition and this is impacted upon uh, due to uh, changes in both economic, demographic, uh, and epidemiological um, transitions throughout uh, life. 
throughout the ages. And together, all of these changes have really led to uh, changes in physical activity. Uh, as you can see there, <laughs> we can now walk the dog with the car, which would be kind of cool. You don't get wet if it's raining, I guess. Um, but it's also led to changes in dietary patterns. And, um, oh good, this works. So, uh, except it's starting quite late. So this one's showing from 1963, uh, 61, sorry. So you can see now changes in dietary patterns. You can see uh, the high caloric uh, countries are the ones coming up in red. And you can see over time they've expanded to encompass not just uh, America, but more of Europe. Australia becomes more red at some point. As we as we start to consume more and more food, and particularly foods high in fat, sugar, oils, uh, and so forth. Um, so I think this is a really uh, cool little animation, and it really depicts changes in particular countries, particularly the Western world, uh, over time, which, um, if you're interested, you can have a look at, at the, the link down here. So really what we're, we're starting to under, uh, ask the question is whether diet is the basis of Western world diseases. So we all know these are the foods we should be eating. These are vegetables, grains, and high fiber. But most of us know that we're more likely to be eating this. <laughs> we're more likely to be eating uh, foods high in fat, sugar, uh, foods that are highly processed. So as such, that we've led, this has led to a Western world diet that is high in fat, sugar, refined foods, processed foods, and high in carbohydrate. And importantly, as a result of this, it's very low in fiber. So I just want to take you through one example of a Western world disease where uh, this parallel exists, um, and that is asthma. So when you look at the incidence of asthma, and think about uh, the changes in food, a uh, little animation I showed you before, the incidence of asthma is above 10% in the very same countries, so in the US, in Australia, New Zealand, and also in the UK. And this incidence of asthma is increasing in the developing countries. So it really parallels an increase in westernized uh, countries, a westernized lifestyle. And I think this is a really interesting parallel as well. So if you look at the uh, counties in Kentucky, you can see that the asthma, uh, incidence of asthma hospitalization is quite high. This is the dark blue areas. And this parallels the incidence of adult obesity. So you can see the same um, areas. Whether this then pa parallels how many KFCs they have, I'm not really sure, but that would be a cool stat as well. Um, so really this, um, this has come back to uh, this argument is as to whether it's a diet that's associated with asthma or whether it's obesity and the fact that the fat is promoting inflammation in individuals. Um, and we're only just starting to understand this now that it's not only fat, it's also diet. You can be a completely healthy individual but have a diet that drives inflammation. So we've come to uh, ask the question, what is causing the asthma epidemic? And there are many different factors, as I've said to you. The hygiene hypothesis has been the prevailing hypothesis, but also this uh, inappropriate TH2 response and perhaps this lack of parasites. Uh, could be diet and obesity. It could also be, there's a, a, for a long time, there's this theory that it could be due to chlorine in the swimming pools. Um, a lot of people have this, it's very strong actual associations with antibiotic use, particularly in childhood and the development of asthma. And what we're just starting to realize is that all of this points to an alteration in the microbiota. Perhaps not swimming pool chlorine, but perhaps it does. Um, so really this is um, where we're focused at the moment in trying to understand uh, alterations in the microbiota, but at first we need to understand what the microbiota uh, is composed of. So this is where the Human Microbiome Project came in. Um, it was done by the NIH. The first phase of which characterized the composition and the diversity of the microbial species, particularly in the nose, mouth, skin, GIT, and UGT. And they also evaluated in parallel the genetic metabolic potential of these different species. And the second phase is not uh, complete yet, but uh, this involves the creation of the first integrated data set of biological product, uh, properties uh, from both the microbiome and also from a host. And in parallel, combining these 
uh, information so that we can understand the influence of the microbiome on associated diseases. So this is going to be really important uh, in trying to understand what these species particularly are doing and then parallel it back to uh, first phase uh, information with the uh, metabolic uh, profiling. So the microbiota, uh, the natural microbiota, is found in many different places, not just in the gut. We have a microbiota uh, of the skin, of the mouth, of the lungs even. So many sites that were originally thought to be sterile are now known to contain a natural microbiota. And just recently, we've even found bacteria, a natural microbiota in the placenta. This really uh, is quite... Um, Amazing that to think that the placenta harbors some kind of microbiota naturally. Uh, we don't know why. Uh, we do know that the uh, flora are very similar to that found in the mouth. And um, it's been proposed that maybe this microbiota plays some kind of role in preventing preterm birth. Uh, but that's all we know at the moment. So as, this is only from a few months ago. So there's a lot more uh, scope and space uh, to understand uh, in this area. So when we look at the gut microbiota, even though I've told you there's many microbiota, if we just bring it in on the gut microbiota, we're actually uh, looking at more microbiota genes uh, than we are human genes, uh, which is quite amazing to, to think. And as many, many of you have probably heard before, that we're actually more bug than we are human. So we actually contain more bugs uh, than we do uh, more bacteria than we do human cells, individual cells. Uh, so when you look at the um, intestinal, intestinal microflora, the, uh, the population of the different species increases the further down we go. So we have only 10 to the 2 to 3 in the stomach, and this gets right down 10 to the 9 to the 12 uh, down in the colon and the appendix. Um, and this, at the same time, uh, there's an increase in diversity, and there's also, uh, as well as an increase in the number of species, there's also an increase in uh, and changes in the function over the length of the uh, gastrointestinal tract. So one of the questions we've asked is, what is a healthy microbiome? And um, some studies of uh, mainly from the Human Genome Project, have, uh, have looked at this, and um, they found that each person's microbiome is unique, such that people have uh, suggested that we could be ID'd based on our microbiota. Um, however, when we look, like, we, we still can't find what is a healthy microbiota, because two people may have completely different microbiota, but still be healthy. However, we can identify that there are certain communities uh, within the microbiota that can be uh, used to predict particular characteristics of that individual. For instance, we can tell if someone has been breastfed and just based on their microbiota. And you can, you can even tell the level of someone's education based on their microbiota. So it is really an ID card. Uh, and the other, the other thing that we can do is uh, some of the uh, microbial communities in one site can also predict that of, an of another site. Um, despite the differences in these two communities. So what does it do? Uh, the main roles of the gut microbiota are in di digestion, uh, production of vitamins, also stimulating cell growth. They're also very really important in uh, tolerance. They also combat infections and particularly important in the development of the immune system. Such that a healthy, uh, healthy microbiota biota on the left uh, should uh, promote a well-regulated state of um, immunity, um, whereas a disrupted uh, microbial community, for example, with uh, antibiotics or salmonella or leading to uh, promotion of Clostridium difficile, this leads to uh, dysbiosis in the microbiota, and this can uh, lead to many different effects. You can have uh, the translocation of toxins through the epithelial barrier, you can have epithelial uh, damage, which is also proposed to increase uh, up, uh, uptake of allergen and also translocation of other bacterial species. And this has been proposed to lead to sepsis, but also this dysbiosis and leakiness can lead to many other inflammatory conditions. 
And this leakiness, and gut leakiness or epithelial leakiness, has really been uh, sort of paralleled to many different diseases. Um, and we're only just starting to understand how important this epithelial layer is. And together with more knowledge about what the epithelial cell actually does in the immune system um, and in directing different immune responses, we're really starting to understand uh, how this microbiota is important uh, in uh, dictating immune responses. So we know that dysbiosis of the microbiota underpins many different diseases. And these are just some of the diseases that uh, we know of here. So as I mentioned, asthma is one of those. But we also have uh, gut microbiota dysbiosis uh, underlying behavioral problems and uh, also other uh, brain-associated uh, problems. Uh, it also underlies allergy, diabetes, many other autoimmune disease, uh, diseases, um, such as arthritis. And really, we're, we're starting to uh, understand that this gut microbiota is really at the basis of many of these different diseases. So this dysbiosis of the microbiota may uh, occur for many different reasons. One of these is the use of antibiotics. And when we look at the, uh, the uh, use of antibiotics, they don't just remove the bacteria, but they also alter the composition of the microbiota. And people have been showing that this uh, alteration in the composition of the microbiota can last for months. So you never actually return to uh, uh, the original state uh, of your, your normal, uh, what was your normal microbiota. It's always changing. And um, perhaps this is why there's this dramatic association between antibiotic use and uh, uh, the incidence of asthma and other allergic uh, diseases. So you can see that the, um, the antibiotics here, this is in the, uh, the ileum and the cecum, um, different antibiotics will have different changes in the species um, and the different populations. You can see that quite clearly from the bar charts there. So really what we're starting to look at now is not just the species that are existing, but also the functionality of these species and which ones are we depleting and which ones are, uh, can we deplete without having too much of a consequence and um, which ones can we not deplete or would be better kept. Another um, really important tool that we've been using uh, recently uh, are germ-free mice. And um, we've just uh, been setting up, or we have set up, a uh, germ-free facility out at Monash. And there's one over at, um, at Wehi, as you know. And um, we use these quite regular, uh, regularly to uh, colonise uh, the mice with specific microbiota, be it specific species or specific communities of micro uh, microbial um, species. And uh, we can also colonise these mice with uh, human microbiota. So there's a, a really, um, a really uh, just point out that germ-free mice look completely different to um, your normal specific um, pathogen-free mice, where you have this really enlarged cecum and um, very, uh, very much inflamed um, or enlarged um, intestinal uh, organs. Um, and I think, yeah, the most, the most um, intriguing study, uh, one of the original studies, was this one uh, in science, where they, they took fecal microbiota from twins. One of the twins was obese and the other one lean. And they found that this obese microbiota could be transferred to the mice. And what was even more interesting is if you co-house the mice with, that had adopted an obese microbiota with the mice that had adopted a lean microbiota, uh, you, you didn't, the obese, the mice that had the obese microbiota uh, didn't uh, increase their body fat or uh, metabolic phenotype as dramatically. So um, this was one of the original studies that really uh, drew together that it was really the fecal microbiota that was driving all these metabolic changes um, that was then uh, underlying or underpinning any, compula uh, any complications downstream of that. So... Really, what I'm trying to say is that the altered gut microbiota really alters the metabolism. And metabolism is extremely complex, hence this picture. I'm not trying to get you to read anything here. 
Um, so I won't take you through all the metabolic pathways, but just to say that there are many different metabolic pathways that are implicated um, once you change or alter the, the gut microbiota. And um, this is really where the focus is now, not really on the species, but understanding uh, the functional consequences of the, uh, those, uh, the existence of those particular species. So uh, one of the studies uh, in particular looked at uh, the microbiota and the metabolism, um, the importance of this. This was um, quite early, back in 2006, uh, where people were uh, obese subjects, were put on a diet, and over time their microbiota and the percentage of Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes uh, changed, such that at the start um, the microbiota of these obese uh, individuals was predominantly Firmicutes, and over time they adapted or changed as they were eating different foods to contain much more of the Bacteroidetes uh, family here. And this Firmicutes species has been associated with uh, inflammation. So if we can switch this uh, ratio, uh, it's been suggested that we'll be uh, healthier individuals. So another uh, study where they've shown that this change in weight really does change the, the gut microbiota is uh, during pregnancy, where they've done, similar to um, the twin study in germ-free mice, if we transfer the gut microbiota of a pregnant uh, female uh, human uh, into uh, germ-free mice, it's not until when, uh, if you transfer the microbiota for the, from the third trimester, this actually ma makes the mouse fat. So really clearly uh, showing that the microbiota are really driving changes in metabolism. And when we look, so if we look at the gut microbiota and metabolism, this is from the original study I showed you in the microbiota diversity hypotheses. We can see that in different countries and in different populations, we have different uh, capacities for metabolism. So for instance, if we look at the, uh, the heat map here, these, uh, these ones are in the US. You can see that they're in the blue here whereas we have the Maldawians and the Amaridians over on the right here. And you can see that there are clear differences in metabolic pathways between uh, these individuals and these ones on the left. So really showing that people from different countries have completely different bacteria and they're com capable of completely different uh, metabolic pathways. And some of those that we've been looking at are amino acid metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism, and vitamin metabolism. Really, they're the main three uh, that uh, we've been concentrating on uh, in the past few years. So one of these I'd like to uh, tell you a bit more about is the metabolism of dietary fiber. And particularly, the metabolism of um, dietary fiber is really underpinned by fermentation of fiber in the gut, uh, and this, uh, this leads to the production of short-chain fatty acids. And these short-chain fatty acids, uh, there are three of them, uh, one, uh, acetate, propionate, and butyrate, and they're produced um, proportionally differently between the two major bacteria, uh, bacterial phyla. So in the acetate and propionate, are mainly produced by the bacteroidetes, and formicutes mainly produce uh, butyrate. This is an, a very uh, big generalization. Uh, but when we look at uh, dietary fiber, there is um, a complete uh, difference in the fermentability of all these different fiber uh, products in that um, they produce different levels of short-chain fatty acids uh, depending on uh, the dietary fiber source. So as I said, these short-chain fatty acids, uh, the major three of which are acetate, propionate, and butyrate. The acetate is the most abundant. And I think the, the clearest study really showing the importance of these short-chain fatty acids is just simply germ-free mice. And because they lack a gut microbiota, they lack the ability to ferment fibre and therefore lack short-chain fatty acids. And we know that uh, germ-free mice have an exacerbated uh, response to inflammation. Uh, therefore underpinning uh, the role of these short-chain fatty acids. We also know that when we give short-chain fatty acids to germ-free mice, this suppresses uh, this inflammation uh, in those mice. 
Uh, and we know that these short-chain fatty acids play a really important role in, in maintaining the integrity of the gut and the epithelial barrier. They're also really important for mucus homeostasis, and they're also extremely important for promoting regulatory T cells. Now, if we look at fiber intake, this is uh, in the US. Uh, you can see in the gray bars is the uh, recommended uh, daily intake of fiber uh, for uh, both males and females over uh, different years. And you can see in the black bars the actual amount of fiber uh, that we're eating. So, or not we, the US are eating. Maybe we're doing a bit better. We like to claim that anyway. Um, so we're really not meeting what is the recommended uh, healthy amount of fiber um, on a daily basis. And there's this really interesting correlation between uh, mortality and intake of fiber, such that the more fiber we eat, the longer we live. And there are many studies that show this uh, association between longevity and the intake of fiber. One of the real crucial uh, studies uh, showing this relationship bef between fiber, uh, inflammation, and short-chain fatty acids was this uh, comparative study uh, between children from Burkina Faso and children from Italy, where in Burkina Faso, they really eat uh, predominantly a high-fiber diet. Uh, they don't eat animal products, they don't eat fat, and they definitely don't eat sugar. So most of their, their diet is very much uh, based on grains, whole grains, and as a result is very high in fiber. And when this study compared the, the gut microbiota of the children in these two different uh, countries, you can see that there's a completely different uh, profile of the two microbiota between the children of these countries. So such that the Firmicutes, sorry, the Bacteroidetes species are much higher uh, a higher proportion of the, uh, the bacteria phyla in the Burkina Faso uh, children. And when you look at uh, the Italian children, this uh, phyla change is completely reversed, where you see mostly Bacteroidetes species. And uh, in this study, they also did a uh, comparison of the changes in the short-chain fatty acids. And they could see that the total short-chain fatty acids was dramatically decreased in the Italian children for all the short-chain fatty acids. So really uh, paralleling this change in uh, gut microbiota uh, and this really uh, dramatic difference in diet uh, with the amount of uh, short-chain fatty acids uh, in these communities. So the main roles of short-chain fatty acids are quite broad. We know that they're really important uh, for, oh, they're, sorry, they're produced by uh, digestion of fiber. And there are many different points at which they can uh, uh, help out the immune system. So one of the first points that this can occur is by uh, competing, uh, the commensal bacteria competing with uh, other bacteria. We can also, from short-chain fatty acids, get uh, mucus secretion. Uh, there's also a major role of short-chain fatty acids in IgA production. They also promote tissue repair or epithelial barrier repair. As I said, uh, very important for Treg function. There's also relatively new data to suggest that there's an interaction with the inflammasome, um, which I won't talk about today, uh, but is done. Uh, major majority of this is work is done by Laurence Macio in um, our group. And they've also been shown to play a really important role in uh, inhibition of inflammation and NF-kappa B responses. Now, the main mechanism underlying the action of short-chain fatty acids really comes down to two completely different uh, pathways. So the main um, and the most well-known mechanism for the action of these short-chain fatty acids is through metabolite-sensing G-protein-coupled receptors. And the other side of this story is uh, the inhibition of uh, histone deacetylases, whereby short-chain fatty acids uh, interfere with histone deacetylases, which leads to this transcriptional, uh, transcriptionally active state and leads to, uh, consequently, uh, downstream effects uh, through to changes in gene regulation. Now, there are many different types of uh, G-protein couple receptors that have been identified. I don't think we've 
uh, reached the point where we've recognised all of these um, metabolite sensing um, G protein coupled receptors, but I'll take you through uh, some of the ones that uh, are recently known, uh, and particularly uh, some of these have only just uh, been known throughout the last couple of years. So the first family are those that recognise uh, acetate propionate butyrate, the short chain fatty acids, and these are GPR 43, 41, and 109A. And you can see that they don't all just recognise one receptor. They also, uh, these short chain fatty acids are recognised by multiple receptors. And there's somewhat um, of a preference for some of these two particular receptors, but in the absence of one receptor, another may compensate. Another family uh, that we've just started to look at are the tryptophan metabolites. So these can be directly uh, from broccoli and also from uh, red meat, but they, they are also from bacterial products uh, and so forth. Uh, and the main receptor here is GPR35. And um, interestingly, these tryptophan metabolites also show some uh, receptor activity for GPR109, but majority uh, of what we know is that most of this is through GPR35. Another family that we've been looking at is medium chain fatty acids. And medium chain fatty acids mostly work through GPR84. However, most of the studies are looking here are, are really in their infancy. We've got a lot more work to do. Another of the um, metabolite uh, sensing families is the, those that uh, detect omega-3 fatty acids. And mostly this is GPR40, uh, 120, but also recognized uh, through GPR40. And the last one there um, is also uh, succinate, which has been shown to work, work via GPR91. Uh, so you can see here I also have listed the main role in immunity. However, a lot of this is, um, is really just starting to come together now. Um, we're only just starting to be fi uh, filling this out. A lot of these uh, receptors, their main role, uh, particularly that keeps coming up, is really in this gut homeostasis, and particularly in the epithelial uh, barrier in promoting uh, tight junctions and um, integrity of the epithelial layer. Uh, we do know that in the absence of a lot of these receptors uh, in knockout mice, uh, those mice show an exaggerated uh, inflammatory response to many different uh, diseases, um, as you would expect, because they're very important in regulating the immune response. Now, something else that I just wanted to bring up is there are many different points at which the diet can intersect the immune system. And we're only just starting to understand uh, the importance of different sites and uh, some of the particular sites I've got listed here, but something that's um, particularly important that we're really looking into that I'll get into uh, at the end of this talk um, is also uh, where diet intersects with fetal development in that we're trying to understand how uh, during pregnancy this can uh, alter the fetal immune system and the development of the, the immune system in the fetus. So uh, a lot of you would know that the microbiota has been uh, thought of as a particular immune, immunotherapy in terms of the pro or prebiotics. Um, we also could, could be considering uh, microbiota as immunotherapy by just changing our diet. And the last uh, point there is uh, that uh, many of you may know or maybe won't, don't want to know, but um, fecal transplant has actually... Uh, become really useful uh, in severe cases of dysbiosis. So the prebiotics and probiotics, predominantly they're altering the growth and the binding of pathogenic uh, bacteria. They're also changing the pH of the, bacteria, uh, of the, the gut. And a lot of these also sh do promote uh, the production of short-chain fatty acids. So do they work? Well, there's uh, a little bit of evidence for that. However, there's a, a group at CSIRO who are showing that uh, pretty much if you stop taking these uh, probiotics, the next day your gut microbiota can just completely revert to what it was. So we're really um, just starting to understand that 
we will require a long-term consumption of these probiotics to really maintain a change in the uh, gut microbiota. So Clostridium difficile infection is a really important uh, a problematic infection um, in hospital settings where uh, the infection is promoted by use of antibiotics and the more antibiotics that are used, the more the bug grows and so forth. And really this gets to a point where the only, uh, the only way that this can be fixed is via a fecal transplantation. And this has been shown to be really useful for many uh, cases of Clostridium difficile infection. And um, this is, yeah, really the, uh, the way, this is where we're going in the future to be treating uh, some of these uh, therapies. So due to Seth's request, I do want to just add a little bit on the end here about recent studies uh, we've been doing in the lab. Um, so my, my background is mainly in asthma. And really what I was interested in was trying to understand this association between uh, the development of asthma and this change in diet. So the question that I asked here was, does a high fiber diet or the short chain fatty acid, acetate, uh, alter the development of asthma? So what I'm showing you here is just the, uh, the standard mouse model of asthma which is based on a house dust mite model of asthma, where we sensitize the mice to house dust mite intranasally, and then we challenge them later, and then we assess the development of allergic airways disease in these mice. So this involves assessing inflammation, lung function, and other characteristics that are associated with human asthma. So in this, uh, this study, what I did was I gave the diet or acetate for three weeks prior to the model and then throughout the model also, and then assessed the effect of the diet or acetate on the development on day 16. So what we found was that high fiber diet suppresses the development of allergic airways disease in these mice. So you can see by the number of eosinophils in the airways, there are none in the, the control group, an increase in eosinophils in the... Uh, the house dust mite mice on the control diet. And this is dramatically reduced when the mice were on a high fiber diet. When they were on a no fiber diet, there wasn't really that much of a change. And then we can also look at other asthma associated markers, such as the TH2 cytokines. And we can see that both IL-5 and IL-13 are also suppressed by a high fiber diet, the blue bars here. And really, when you're, when you're looking at uh, these asthma studies, the most important uh, readout is the physiological readout, readout, which is, can the mouse breathe? So this is the lung function of these mice. And you can see that this is resistance of the airways uh, over an increasing dose of a stimulant to the airways. And you can see that the resistance in the airways, it does increase with an increase in the stimulus. However, it's markedly reduced in the high fiber fed mice and increased in the no fiber fed mice. So really showing to us, this was the first point at which uh, we really uh, found that high fiber diet suppresses the development of allergic airways disease. And we also showed here that the diets change the composition of the microbiota. You can see here that they cluster completely differently. So this is the, the fecal palates, the sequencing. You can see the control diet here, the no fiber and the high fiber, really indicating that there's a completely different uh, species population uh, in, these, um, uh, in these fecal samples. And this is also depicted uh, on the phylogenetic level. And you can see here the first five mice uh, on the control diet, the second five mice on a high fiber diet, oops, and the last five on a no fiber diet. And you can see straight away that there are these huge differences in the uh, presence of Firmicutes in the control diet, Bacteroidetes in the high fiber diet, and also the proteobacteria really uh, coming in with the, high, uh, the no fiber diet. And we can look at this right down to the species level. And you can start to tell the differences are even more pronounced uh, in that we have changes in uh, particular species. I won't go through that. Uh, just to point out, though, that one of, the, one of the things that we did see was within this Bacteroidetes uh, 
phyla, which is uh, predominantly uh, in the high fiber fed mice, we could identify two particular species that had really high resemblance to a high acetate producing bacteroidetes uh, species uh, type. So really showing that we're getting this increase uh, in bacteroidetes, but particularly in these species that are really uh, good at producing acetate. And when we measure the short-chain fatty acids in the, in the serum of these mice, you can see that the mice that are on a high-fibre diet have a, a much uh, higher concentration of acetate and uh, propionate in their serum uh, compared to just a control-fed uh, mice, the mice, or uh, no-fibre-fed mice. So what we were uh, interested in uh, looking at here is whether we could show the same thing when we gave acetate in the drinking water. So, and indeed we could. So acetate is just a salt that does dissolve. It's essentially vinegar, um, but we, we use the salt form. Uh, we put this in the drinking water of the mice, and we were able to show that acetate also suppressed the development of allergic airways disease in their mice, in the mice. So a decrease in eosinophils, TH2 cytokines, and also a decrease in the lung function of these mice. So what I was particularly uh, interested in looking at is whether, uh, I've cut out a whole section of the story here, so it's a little bit difficult to, um, to make this flow, but, and I apologize for that, but what I was really interested in is whether uh, a change in, the, in diet in pregnancy could alter the predisposition of the offspring. Uh, so we did all of these studies to show, and we, we showed that if you gave a, a pregnant mouse a high fiber diet or acetate, and then as soon as her pups were born, you gave those pups and the mother just normal diet, um, and you waited until those pups were adults, and then you gave those pups asthma, um, as we've got here, so we we'll wait until these pups are adults, and um, then we give them asthma. Uh, when the pregnant mother was on a high fiber diet or acetate, this completely suppressed the development of asthma in her offspring. Now, I haven't shown you that data here, but what we then wondered was whether this was due to the transfer of a microbiota. So the only way we can investigate that is by looking at the cesarean, uh, doing a cesarean transfer. And uh, so we cesarean transfer at, at uh, two days before birth uh, onto a foster mother. And it was really interesting to us to see that despite the fact that we cesarean transferred these pups, the pups that were from a mother on a high fiber diet or on acetate still had suppressed asthma uh, symptoms or characteristics. So really showing to us that it wasn't the microbiota, even though I've told you for the last 50 minutes that everything is the microbiota. Um, so it wasn't the microbiota in the offspring, but it, it may be then directed back to the microbiota of the pregnant uh, mouse. So, and that's just to show the other effects. So what, um, what I was then interested in obtaining was whether uh, this happened in humans as well. And I uh, rang up one of my old supervisors in Newcastle and said to him, do you have any pregnant serum in the freezer where you know whether the mothers had children with asthma? And he's like, yeah, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> so I'll have some of that, please. And um, they also had a diet study that associated with this, which was amazing. So we were able to correlate, uh, this is in pregnant uh, women, uh, their intake of dietary fiber and their concentration of acetate. And there's this correlation between the higher amount of fiber um, that these mothers were eating, the higher acetate levels they had in their serum. However, this wasn't uh, true for the other two short-chain fatty acids. So there was no correlation with propionate or butyrate, really suggesting that the correlation was something to do with this increase in uh, acetate. So as I said to you, I wanted to know what happened then in the children. And so what we did, just simply, uh, we measured the acetate in the serum, and then we split the mothers into two groups. So those with acetate levels above the median and those with acetate levels below the median. And then when we looked in at their children, it was those mothers that had high acetate levels above the median that had really low incidence of asthma in their children. 
So their infants were less likely to visit the GP for wheeze or cough, and they were also less likely to report wheeze in the first 12 months of life. So these children are only one year old, so we can't tell if they actually have asthma or not, but these factors are really uh, predominant and predisposing uh, factors for the development of asthma in later life. And then when we look at the other short-chain fatty acids, propionate, we have perhaps the inverse association, where the higher propionate uh, levels we have, uh, the more likelihood uh, the ch child will um, visit for uh, wheeze or cough or have wheeze in the first 12 months of life. There really seems to be no uh, association with uh, butyrate here. So really highlighting and pinpointing acetate as a really important metabolite uh, predisposing to the development of asthma. Now, I don't have time to go through the, the whole story, but just to summarise uh, what I presented um, the other day and um, some of this work, what we've been able to show in my study is that dietary fibre intake leads to this production of short-chain fatty acids, particularly acetate, and acetate is known to go through the bloodstream. And by going through the bloodstream, we've also shown that it enters the fetus, and this acetate has actually, in my study, it's not... Uh, working through G protein coupled receptors because we've shown that this effect also occurs in GPR43 knockout mice. Uh, but what I've been able to show is that acetate actually inhibits histone deacetylases, in particular HDAC9. And what this does is it leads to an increase in uh, FOXP3 transcription. And this does two things. Uh, the paper that we're putting together now, as I said, this is unpublished, um, details how FOXP3 uh, transcription leads to an increase in Tregs and that these are absolutely essential for the function of acetate in suppressing asthma. And the other thing that FOXP3 does is it binds upstream of a number of different uh, genes that we've identified via AFMetrics. And by doing this, it binds upstream of the promoter region or in the promoter region and silences the transcription of these genes. And together, this is actually leading to a state of increased immune regulation. And as such, uh, we think this is really underpinning the decrease in asthma that we're seeing in our studies. And we also think that this really explains uh, the increase in incidence of asthma in the Western world, whereby that we're not eating as much dietary fiber. And it's known that asthma is somewhat inherited and really what we're coming back to here is that this inheritance can be through diet. Inheritance can also be through changes on the fetal uh, immune system. And inheritance is definitely driven by epigenetic uh, inheritance um, in this model. So uh, I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Is there any possibility of using short-chain fatty acids as supplements or sort of directly affect Yeah, sure. So um, I actually spoke, I think it was in um, the information seminar about this. We got a whole conversation about this going. So uh, short-chain fatty acids, particularly acetate, acetate being vinegar, has been uh, for a long time associated with good health. So if you Google acetate and good health, it, everyone will tell you how wonderful apple cider vinegar is, particularly the organic side. There's a lot of people um, that swear by drinking apple cider vinegar. Every morning, they'll have a shot of it. Um, no one's looked at whether this works. Um, people swear by it, and the data is showing that, um, yeah, it could be of use, and it could be um, beneficial. Um, but really, it's early days, we don't know. Um, in your experiments that you have acetate in your drink, in the drinking water, um, does the mice show different behaviour to drink the water? Do they finish the drinking the water? Uh, they drink the same amount of. So we have yeah measured normal water versus um, acetate. It's only two hundred millimolar, and you can't actually smell the difference, or and there's no difference in pH. Uh, it's different with the other short chain fatty acids. So people have shown with propionate, it actually changes the behavior of uh, rats. And um, uh, particularly, they, they start running around in circles and having all these um, strange behavioral um, traits, um, which I'm not fully aware of why they're doing that. 
Um, but the other one is when you give butyrate in the drinking water, it stinks. So it smells like rancid butter, because um, that is actually one of the uh, rancid uh, smells in butter, is butyrate. Um, but acetate, no, there's no real change. And also the transgenerational epigenetics. Mm -hmm. Is that something well established? Because I kind of read recently that's a quite controversial, right? Like transgenerational. Uh, of epigenetics, yeah. Yeah, so we really need to go uh, we've only done the maternal side. We don't know the paternal side. We also don't know how many generations this is inherited. So whether it's pure inheritance, um, yeah, we don't know yet. Um, you mentioned that um, some of the results from the Japanese population are anomalous in terms of some of the hypotheses you, you brought up at the start of your talk. Yeah. You, is there any indication that they have a higher fibre diet or a higher acetate diet in yeah. the Western population? Yeah, it's really interesting. When um, So I've learned a lot more about Japanese food. I love Japanese food, <laughs> which is good. Um, but when you think about Japanese food, apart from a lot of fish, you think about rice. And has anyone made sushi before? Do you know what you put in the rice? Oh. Yeah, exactly, vinegar. So... Um, yeah, that, that's just an association we've made, but maybe that's um, one of the parallels there. But also, I went to a Japanese or an Asian grocer, and they have like little fruit boxes, that are like apple cider vinegar fruit boxes, marketed for kids. So whether that's just an association or it makes sense, I don't know. Um, there are a lot of little things like that. Even um, the ginger is preserved um, in vinegar. They eat a lot more vinegar. Uh, the, other, the other side of this is... Um, not so much high fibre through grains, but fibre through resistant starches. And resistant starch really comes up when you cool rice. So cold rice and also cold potatoes have really high resistant starches in them. And by consuming resistant starches, you have an increase in, you lead to, it leads to an increase in acetate and short-chain fatty acids. So there's definitely, definitely parallels there, but nothing's proven. <laughs> it kind of makes sense, but yeah. I think we've probably got time for one quick question from Joan. Um, so I was intrigued by the fact that a, it seemed like a, a single fecal transfer could um, cure a very difficult clostridium difficile type infection. Yeah. And yet consuming probiotics every day would essentially collapse at the minute you stop taking them. Is there an explanation for what's so special about that is. fecal transfer? Um, that's a good question. I would imagine it's something to do with uh, the depletion of particular species and the lack of them in the first place. Really what we've got to do is support those species. So by just putting them in with a probiotic, you're not supporting their growth by feeding them the right thing. So if, you, if you're not still eating, if you're still eating McDonald's and those bacteria that you ate with the probiotics really need high fibre to generate, then it's uh, of no use. Whereas these patients in the hospital are mostly on feeding tubes. Uh, so it's a much more simplistic, uh, I guess, um, association and simplistic model um, where these bacteria are able to, uh, to thrive and to really transplant and, and live. They're much more happy. Sorry, we've got a little bit over time there. If you have not answered questions you'd like, please come down and chat to Alison. And join me in thanking you for a wonderful presentation.